Frontier Fighters. Frontier Fighters, dramatic chapters in the heroic lives of the buckskin trailblazers who won the American West. One of these was Dr. John McLaughlin, the warm-hearted and courageous chief factor or governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, who, though a Canadian employed by a British trading company operating on British-controlled territory, did more to encourage the American emigration movement into the Oregon country than any other single individual. 1840. Fort Vancouver, capital of the Pacific Northwest, on the Columbia River, north of the mouth of the Willamette. John, dear, for a penny pension Scotsman, you're a poor man. Well, I cannot be poor, darling, on my salary of $12,000 a year. Mm, but you are. John, I've just finished your private accounts, mm. and you've only $200 to your name. Well... This month will soon be over, and I'll then be worth $1,200. If you keep on giving those Yankee immigrants credit on money, real money, you and I'll die in the Montreal poorhouse. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, you can, I'm a doctor. Aye, John. I can, too. You're a businessman, an employee of Hudson's Bay. It doesn't mind if you treat sick Americans, but it do mind if you sell them forbidden goods, on credit, too. Oh. My dear, uh, as chief factor of Hudson's Bay, I I'm practically absolute ruler of 443,000 square miles of territory. You mind? Uh, I did not see the connection. Uh, but I do. If you didn't put away that ledger, I'll invoke the power of my official capacity and punish you. Punish me? How? By giving that uh, $200 to the first American who comes through yon door. Oh, John, you wouldn't. <laughs> oh, wouldn't I? <laughs> uh, come in. Oh, why, Reverend Jason Lee, good evening. Good evening, Mrs. McLaughlin. Good evening, Doctor. And uh, what can we do for you, Reverend? Oh, Doctor, you must do something for Daniel, my brother. Uh, there is not much I can do, except I recommend a warmer climate to heal those weak lungs of his. Uh, but I haven't any money. My Indian mission has taken all that I brought with me from the United States. Uh, how much will it take? Why, well, I can buy him a passage on a schooner bound for the Sandwich Islands for exactly... Two hundred dollars. Yes, yes, two hundred dollars. But how did you know? <laughs> Don't mind my wife, uh, Reverend Lee. <laughs> Every so often she gets inspired about money. Uh, darling. Yes, dear? Uh, please give the Reverend Lee that two hundred dollars you were speaking to me about the new... Uh, with God's blessing. <laughs> Unflinchingly loyal to the Hudson's Bay Company's interests, and more than generous and helpful to the American fur trappers, missionaries, and emigrants, fighting tooth and nail for a foothold in the Northwest, Dr. McLaughlin's tact and diplomacy was put to its severest test whenever the Indians went on one of their period rampages. Look, Eagle Wing, pale face wigwam on the river bank. Built, I see a thunderbird. It is big and built of the trees which belong to us. And it is filled with skins of animals which are ours, who have always held this land. When do we attack? At dawn, when pale faces sleep. I have spoken. Mm -hmm. 
Eagle Wing. Sun rises. It is the signal. Yes. Attack and take no prisoners. Look, oh, Thunderbird, the white squaw. I see her. She makes music with hollow reeds. What new medicine is this? Look, oh, chief, she comes nearer. A warrior squaw walking to her death. How low the pale face has fallen to send a squaw a sacrifice. Look, Thunderbird, your braves. They have laid down their arms. The magic reeds have enchanted them. She has bewitched them. You, Eagle Wing, will make the sacrifice. Kill her. I cannot, Thunderbird. She is a squaw. Ah, when red blood turns to white water, even a great chief is without power. I will speak to her. I Speak, white devil squaw. I'm near a squaw. I'm a Scot of the clan, McGregor. A pale-faced warrior? But your dress... It is a white squaws. It is near squaws, but the kilt, sporran, and tam are shanter of the heelands of bonnie Scotland. Why do you confuse my braves with your devil music? The white doctor is ready for the council. The council? Aye, the council. He's a canny one, our good doctor. He thought you'd forget the council, so he sent me to remind you. Come, I'll pipe your doom to Fort Vancouver. For many hours, the Indians were held spellbound by the Scotch bagpipe music completely forgetting they had come for white scouts. When the exhausted piper was carried from the council chamber, the chiefs, hypnotized by the wild music of the fighting Highland clans, signed a treaty with Dr. McLaughlin never again to make war on Fort Vancouver. One evening, as Dr. McLaughlin entertained some of his friends in his cabin... <laughs> this is indeed a droll situation. A Jacques Bienville, a Frenchman. A for my hero, the Wellington Duke, while the good doctor, an Englishman, chooses Napoleon. <laughs> well, if Dr. McLaughlin takes a Napoleon, so will I. But not Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, then Napoleon who? Dr. McLaughlin... I choose the greatest Napoleon of them all, Napoleon Brand. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, come in. Where's Dr. McLaughlin? Oh, here, here near the fire. Well, why, Sir John, welcome under Fort Vancouver. Sit your doon and, and hear spot of brandy. Not now, Doctor. Later, perhaps. Uh, what's troubling your mind, Sir John? Doctor, I have a letter with me authorizing oh, me... Oh, I to... can, I can. <laughs> authorizing you to give me a good talking to... Admonish me to, to stop feeding the starving Americans. See, he's giving them seed and farm implements. No, Doctor. It's more serious than that. Dr. McLaughlin, you've been dismissed from Hudson's Bay. Dismissed? Well, well that's impossible, man. Hudson's Bay wouldn't... Why, why, why they, they couldn't dismiss me. Here's the letter. I'll read it to you. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll take your word for it. But, man, it is a blow. A terrible blow. Bidding farewell to Port Vancouver, the log castle from which he ruled so benevolently the company's great private empire, Dr. McLaughlin journeyed to Oregon to begin life anew. Here he built a saw and grist mill. But there were some Americans south of the Columbia River who did not prove as hospitable as the good doctor anticipated. Oh, look, John, coming up the hill, a mob of men. Oh, lost here it is now, a mob. Probably a delegation to implore my help in, in some great project. Oh, it is a mob, John, an angry mob. Listen. Oh, shut yourself in your mill, John. That mob's coming for you. Oh, but why for me? I ain't harmed anyone. Because you're Hudson's Bay, former chief factor and a hated man. This is the United States, John, not Canada. Oh, hush now, here they are. That big fella in the beaver hat is the spokesman. Mark well to what he says. Fire! Fire! Uh, gentlemen, your numbers overwhelm me, and uh, your enthusiasm leaves me speechless. Never mind the sword pudding, ye Hudson's Bay Company. Wine! Wine! Well, oh, well, but, men, uh, I'm no longer in the employ of Hudson's Bay. I I've left Canada for good. I I'm going to become a citizen of the United States. Yeah. Fire! Fire! You may have filed your intentions of becoming an American citizen. You may lead our Fourth of July parade. And you may bribe our territorial lawmakers with high hats and fancy pipes. But, McLaughlin, you'll never become a citizen of our union. Fire! <laughs> we'll see to it that you'll never own a single square foot of American land. Listen to me, you Yankee uh, ingrate. Uh, hush, darling, hush. John, I'm going to have them say if they kill me. American, before you stands one of North America's greatest men. His only mistake 
His only mistake was that he loved and served humanity to such an extent that today Dr. John McLaughlin is a man without a country. Canada ignores him. The English despise him, and you Americans hate him. Why? I'll tell you why. For the great and lasting good he has done your countrymen in making safe the very ground on which you stand. Ah, more so, Woody. Oh, no. I thought it to serve American patriots like us. But talking won't do you a bit of good. We're here to teach you British you can't run Oregon. Uh, what, what are you going to do? Do? Why, McLaughlin, you renegade. You turncoat. You psalm singing hypocrite. We're going to burn down your mill. Get going, boy. <laughs> Bad hurt, Doctor. Not in a strictly physical sense, Mrs. McLaughlin. But John's heart is broken. We Americans have sacrificed a saint. Wife, where are you? Here I am, John, dear. Beside your bed. Uh, tell them, those Americans, that John McLaughlin forgives them. Hush, John. Rest now, so you'll be strong tomorrow. Uh, It'll, it'll be not tomorrow for me, but there'll be a tomorrow for the Pacific Northwest. Many grand tomorrows. Uh, I, I, I see vast farms with fruit trees in full bloom. Uh, big cities with tall white buildings. Laughing, happy children attending fine schools. Oh, John, dear. Uh, you cannot stop progress. It is God's will. And the Americans yet unborn, who will settle on this land, will be the most progressive people on our Heavenly Father's green earth. His pride crushed, even denied the right to own a single acre of American land, to become a citizen of the country he had grown to love. Dr. John McLaughlin, the man whom history has glorified as the father of Oregon, crossed the last frontier to great and everlasting immortality. Another glorious human document of the pioneers who penetrated the American wilderness and made it safe for those who sought the gold of peace and security in the land of the setting sun.